hailed as a step in the right direction, Somalia opens its first forensic laboratory to process rape kits. Medical experts sound the alarm as cholera spreads on the continent. And a tech giant unveils its new space age headquarters. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. Somalia has opened its first forensic laboratory to process rape kits. Sexual assault is widespread in the country, according to human rights groups. But few victims ever come forward and few perpetrators are ever punished. The new forensic lab in Somalia's Puntland region is being hailed as a step in the right direction. But a long road remains to end impunity for gender-based violence. Neha Wadeka reports from Garoway in Somalia. Somalia has opened its first forensic laboratory to investigate rape cases. The lab, with support from the Swedish government and the UN Population Fund, brings cutting-edge technology to a part of the world still lacking paved roads and reliable electricity. We used to send DNA from here to Nairobi or from here to South Africa. So those restraints now are easy. We can manage this and answer, get answers within a timely period, within hours, within minutes, where we used to have days, sometimes months, to get to receive those. There will not be a stigma. There will not be a discussion about who did this, who did uh, the crime, who did the rape, who did, you know. So they, it's a big encouragement. The lab opened less than a year after the Puntland region passed its first law criminalizing sexual offenses. There are some police officers who say rape is not a big deal and consider it a minor thing. They say it is nothing new. Kish Shamis Kabdibail is the only police officer in her unit. She handles all cases involving sexual violence in Puntland. Officer Bail says many of her rape cases are handled by community elders. The perpetrator's family may be ordered to pay the victim's family in camels or goats. And that is just the cases that women report. I was shy and said to myself, don't tell your story to anyone because it is shameful. I even hid the story from my husband. Fatima agreed to be interviewed on the condition that VOA changed her name. She and her friend were collecting firewood near an IDP camp in Puntland a year ago when three men attacked them. Fatima was pregnant. I was in month four of pregnancy. I miscarried the baby days later. She has found support at the women's center attached to the local hospital. It's a safe space that advocates are now using to get the word out about the new forensic lab. The hope is that between the new law, the new lab, and community outreach, that Somali women will see justice. Neha Wadiker for VOA News, Garraway, Somalia. We're still in East Africa. In Kenya's lakeside city of Kisumu, a group of men stormed a hotel where a Christian women's organization was holding a meeting related to the upcoming presidential rerun election. Meeting participants say the men stopped the meeting and attacked the women. Police had to fire tear gas and bullets in the air to disperse the young men who smashed windows and broke chairs using the pieces to beat the women. Rumors were swelling on social media that the women's meeting was intended to plan the renting of voter identification cards, a rigging tactic alleged by the opposition before last month's election. Participants in the meeting denied that uh, that was the purpose and say they were meeting to see how to encourage peaceful voting. We were doing introduction. We were talking on our roles as women uh, when it comes to peace and justice, our role as women. That is what we are talking about. So before the first session ended, a group of men came in and uh, they ordered us out. Well, Kenyans are constantly dealing with online hoaxes and fake news stories from all sides of the political aisle. Now, the UN mission in South Sudan is proposing a plan for authorities and agencies to work together to provide security and social services in the country's western Bar al Ghazal region and enable displaced civilians to return to their homes. Thousands of families who fled their homes who remained sheltered in makeshift camps around the town, relying on humanitarian aid to survive. Fighting between government and opposition forces has subsided in the town in recent months, prompting about 6,000 people to go back home. The United Nations 
Johnson says a sense of security needs to, to be firmly established to encourage more people to return home and rebuild their lives. And many look forward to going back home if their safety can be guaranteed. We need an enabling environment for security uh, to prevail in the whole of world. And that enabling environment can only be guaranteed by the police and the state government. Uh, the bringing in of the military was meant to fight the rebellion. And of course now, right now, uh, the, the, the level of rebellion has, caused, has gone down. We have not seen rebel activities in the last three months in around Wow. So uh, there would be no more need for the military to be intensively in, in, uh, deployed around the, the town because that creates fear among civilians. Well, a new proposed model to help civilians return home seeks to involve UN peacekeepers and humanitarian organizations working together with local authorities, police and national security to provide needed services. The UN has already offered to increase its peacekeeping presence uh, through night patrols. Now, European Union Interior Minister said Thursday they are determined to prevent migrants launching from the coast of Libya. Uh, this announcement comes and critis amid criticism from rights advocates who say the strategy is aggravating human suffering. After more than two years struggling to stem the flow of refugees and migrants from the Middle East and Africa, the European Union is cautiously hopeful it is finally in control. A 2016 deal with Turkey effectively closed one major migratory route. And this year, Italy has led EU efforts to curb a sea crossing from Libya, supplying money, equipment and training for Libya's border and coast guard. The EU has also struck deals with local groups in control on the ground in a country still largely lawless after the 2011 death of longtime leader Muammar Gaddafi. While U.S. President Donald Trump says he is fairly close to a deal with congressional leaders regarding the undocumented immigrants who, come, who came to America as children and that any agreement must include massive border security. But House Democrat, uh, Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi and Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer uh, said after meeting with the president Wednesday night uh, that they had agreed to quickly put in place protections for the 800,000 people who registered under DACA. Trump's uh, press secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders gave a different assessment of conclusions reached at Wednesday's meeting. Sanders wrote on Twitter, while DACA and border security were both discussed, there was no final agreement. Sanders also attempted to uh, downplay Trump reaching out to the Democratic leaders after months of ridiculing those same lawmakers for not backing his agenda. You guys keep trying to distort this into a bad thing is I think exactly why uh, this president was elected. They were sick and tired of business as usual. They wanted somebody who would break up the status quo that would bring people from both sides of the table together to have conversations. This president's done more for bipartisanship in the last eight days than Obama did in eight years. Well, the, the DACA program allowed the 800,000 people who had registered under uh, the program to work and study in the United States temporarily without the fear of deportation. Now, President Trump uh, rescinded the DACA program last week, giving Congress six months to work out a permanent solution. Well, turning now to technology news, the GSMA Mobile World Congress is a combination of the world's largest exhibition for the mobile industry and conference featuring prominent executives representing mobile operators, device manufacturers, technology providers, vendors, and content owners from around the world. For more about the Mobile World Conference, Pritesh Chauhan, who is a senior marketing manager, GSMA Mobile for Development Foundation, joins me live via Skype from San Francisco, California. Pritesh, welcome to Africa 54. Good morning. Thanks now, for me. first, help us understand that up to this point, what has been achieved at the conference? Yeah, so we're on day three of, um, of what has been a, a really successful conference with uh, lots of exhibitors on show, and we've had some great speakers in the conference cent uh, center in the mornings uh, and through the day, just talking about how innovation is changing, how tech is, is developing, um, lots of discussion around uh, 5G and what that could enable, and how the US is really being a driving force um, when it comes to comes to that technology, so yeah, it's been it's been great, and we're on yeah. the, the third day now. And uh, very importantly, your uh, your particular company is uh, pushing this campaign called Case for Change. What is it? 
That's right. So um, part of the mobile industry's commitment to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals um, is to is to really highlight the, the great work on the industry is doing and mobile operators in particular around connectivity. So connecting everyone and everything to a better future is our is our united um, driving mission. And part of that, uh, we launched a campaign here called Case for Change, which is a, a journey around the world to 18 different countries over the next six months, where we're going to send some of the greatest technology and gadgets to uh, remote places where connectivity has really changed their lives and get them to tell their story in their own words. Um, we're going to use social media influencers to, uh, to, to tell the story and we're going to promote the stories um, across YouTube and social media over the next uh, the next few weeks, there'll be one a week for the next six months. Now, very um, quickly, you said, uh, I, I know that you'll be traveling also to Africa. Can you mention the countries and the programs you'll be working with? Yeah, 100%. So um, we start in the US um, next week, and the story we told there is about a wearable uh, connectivity where blind people and low vision people can navigate around their day to day uh, with the use of an agent that's linked to their smart glasses um, and just transforming their world. After we leave the US, we're going to Africa, and um, we're going to go to Tanzania, where the three mobile operators together have connected uh, a whole society and community, which is just changing everything around uh, education and health and uh, business and commerce. So we're um, we're going to go and get the speak to those people and get them to tell their story um, and, and promote it to the world because there's so much incredible things being done through connectivity. After that, we go to Kenya and tell uh, an MTBA story, which is around a mobile health service uh, linked to M-Pesa, and just show how incredible that whole initiative is. Um, and how, how it's transformed lives um, in Africa, but just promoted to, to the wider world who may not know. Uh, and then we'll go to Japan and, mm -hmm. and, and India and Sri Lanka and a wow. whole, whole heap of places. What a campaign, Mr. Chowan. Thank you very much for joining us today from San Francisco. Thank you very much. All right, that's uh, Pritesh Chowan, uh, who's the Senior Marketing Manager at the GSMA Mobile Development Foundation. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends also. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Now coming up, the health workforce and sustainable development goals. Stay with us. This is BizBeat. It's called RoboChef, a restaurant in Tehran where customers order pizza on touchscreen tables. Customer Andreas Ripstein and his wife can also enjoy playing games on the interactive touchscreen while they wait for their order. Just to make your own pizza here, choose the different ingredients and so a new experience. Once ordered, the pizza or the drinks are delivered to you not by a waiter but by a conveyor belt. Computer engineer Hossein Zaibadel is the restaurant's co-founder and manager. He also designed the ordering system software and the automated serving belt. He says, we didn't want robotic automation to be limited to factories and high-tech firms. We wanted to bring it to the community so that people can use it better. Customers seem to like it. The restaurant is busy, and in some ways, Zaibadel says, the service is faster, and it's a different environment and less boring. For Andreas and his wife, that seems to be the case for now. For VOA's BizBeat, I'm Philip Alexio. Well, it's time now for our health report. And joining us now is Africa 54 health correspondent, Lino Madu, with some news on the workforce and sustainable development goals. Lino. Well, as the global community ramps up its efforts to attend the Sustainable Development Goals SDGs 2030, experts say there is a need to invest more in the health workforce, especially in low- and middle-income countries. The World Health Report 2006 estimated a global shortage of 4.3 million health workers. Since then, a lot has been done and some countries have seen some improvements. One SDG sub-target 3C aims, quote, to increase substantially the recruitment, development, training, and retention of the health workforce. 
However, medical observers say many challenges remain. They say the quantity, skills, and geographic distribution of the health workforce are key factors that have held back even greater and more equitable progress on global development. For more on the subject, uh, we are joined uh, live via Skype from Boston, Massachusetts, by Dr. Vanessa Carey, founder and CEO of Seed Global Health, an organization that specializes in building the health workforce in Africa. Dr. Carey, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to join you. It's great to have you. Listen, there are some statistics that show that as of 2015, the African region had an average of 1.30 health workers per 1,000 population, far below the 4.5 per 1,000 required for sustainable development goals. That's quite a, a big gap right there. What is your reaction? It's a startling gap because the African continent also has about a quarter of the world's global burden of disease, and they have only 3% of the world's healthcare workforce to address that disease. And what fundamentally is really bothersome to me and the whole team at Seed Global Health is that there are two standards of care in the world, and in 2017, that doesn't need to be the case, and that's what we're really trying to work against. So where does the process start, and where do we see the most pressing need as we try to address this challenge? So over 90% of the countries in the sub-Saharan African continent have critical shortages of doctors, nurses, and midwives. And we at Seed Global Health really work with local partners, the institutions and the countries where we're working in order to change that so that there are enough doctors, nurses and midwives to not only provide outstanding care for the populations and the health needs of a country, but also to ensure that they can train their successors and support the health system as a whole. Our goal is to help really invest in future health leaders who become agents of change and really help demand something different in 2017 and closing this gap um, to ensure that everybody everywhere has access to the same quality of care. We hear a lot about health system strengthening, which is very, very critical, but it's, there seems to be an emphasis on infrastructure. So what did outbreaks like Ebola and Zika taught us in terms of the importance of the workforce? Absolutely. There has been, to your point, investment in infrastructure and, you know, providing medicines and all of those are critically important. But you need people to walk the halls of hospitals and clinics and you need people to deliver medications and to follow patients on it. But you also need people to understand the complexity of disease and what is happening with it. So Ebola happened at the scope and scale that it happened in West Africa because there weren't enough healthcare professionals to help sound the alarm, mount the response, and build the strategy to stop Ebola in its tracks. And one of the great lessons that I think has been learned is the need for that kind of uh, sort of healthcare provider to be able to really help protect a country. It's a global health security issue okay. at this point. And as we go into the UN, you know, week next week and the really look at sustainable development goals, I believe that healthcare providers have to be and healthcare professionals have to be top of the list. Okay, Dr. Carey, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And that was uh, Dr. Vanessa Carey. She's founder and CEO of Seed Global Health. Now, medical experts are sounding the alarm as the waterborne disease cholera is spreading in Africa and other parts of the world. More than 500 people have died in a cholera epidemic that is sweeping across the Democratic Republic of Congo. The World Health Organization says the epidemic has spread to at least 20 of Congo's 26 provinces. Observers say outbreaks of the disease occur regularly in Congo, mainly due to poor sanitation and a lack of access to clean drinking water. But this year's epidemic has already hit at least 10 urban areas, including the capital, Kinshasa. About 1.4 million people have been displaced by violence in the central Kasai region. Meanwhile, the United Nations says efforts to contain a cholera outbreak in northeast Nigeria are being hampered by the lack of a referral system to identify new cases. The UN says the outbreak has struck more than 1,000 people housed in camps for those who fled Boko Haram. UNICEF and other partners are assisting health officials in the northeastern state of Bornu to contain the outbreak. That region is at the epicenter of the Islamist militant insurgency and the disease outbreak. Um, 
They administered drip to me. The vomiting and diarrhea stopped and I got better. Cholera is an acute diarrheal infection spread by contaminated food and water. It can be easily treated with oral rehydration solution if it is caught early, but it can also kill within hours if left untreated. This most recent outbreak began in late August, and aid workers had already warned that Nigeria's rainy season could spread disease in displacement camps that were already unsanitary. The main problem that we have been having uh, is the fact that, you know, when the people are sick, uh, although we are spreading messages, uh, when the people are sick, I mean, they, they, they don't proactively report you know, to, to the clinics. They don't proactively engage with humanitarian partners. So we have to do what we call active case finding, means that we have to go uh, to find them in their houses. UNICEF says more than 20,000 people have been killed in Nigeria's conflict with Boko Haram. At least 2.2 million have been displaced. Cholera is also spreading in other parts of the world. In the wake of the 2016's Hurricane Matthew, the affected parts of Haiti experienced a 50% increase in cholera cases due to a lack of clean drinking water. Medical officials are now concerned that cases of cholera will increase in the aftermath of Hurricane Irma. In Yemen, cholera has infected at least 612,000 people and killed over 2,000 since it began in April. Observers say the epidemic has exacerbated the already dire humanitarian situation in the war-ravaged country. Um, Yemen has become the largest humanitarian crisis in the world as a result of combination of conflict, cholera and food insecurity. The Red Cross warns that cholera could impact 850,000 people in Yemen by the end of the year. And that's our health report for today. To stay in touch, find me on Twitter at Lenor Moudou. Back to you, Vincent. Well, thanks a lot, Lenor. I'll be sure to watch Lenor Moudou's health reports every Tuesday and Thursday right here on Africa 54. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, Apple unveils a tribute to Steve Jobs. A new futuristic campus will be right back. you've just joined us, I'm Mariama Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines. In South Sudan, thousands of families who left the western Bahar El Ghazal region because of fighting continue to rely on humanitarian aid. In Kenya, police in Kisumu fired tear gas and bullets to disperse young men who broke into a hotel and beat women attending an election meeting. In Nigeria, Ministry of Women Affairs and Social Development holds a send forth event for 106 girls who were freed after being kidnapped by Boko Haram. In Niger, United Nations humanitarian chief visited displaced civilians in the country's Gagam displacement site. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Well, welcome back to Africa 54, and here's what's trending. Now, you're looking at Apple's massive, pristine new campus in Cupertino, California. One of Steve Jobs' dying wishes was to build a stunning new headquarters for Apple. The tech giant says the building's walls are the largest panels of curved glass ever made. Now, the entire campus will be powered by renewable energy, including a 17-megawatt solar farm mounted on the building's roof. Now, the entire ring is designed to shift in the event of an earthquake. The campus includes the Steve Jobs Theater, a 1,000-seat presentation space and exhibit hall. Well, next up, pizzas uh, travel from the kitchen straight to the customers' tables in this unique restaurant in Tehran, Iran. Robochev looks like uh, an ordinary eating place before you notice the touch screen tables and a conveyor belt stretching through the middle. And the restaurant's owners say all tables are booked every night. Uh, proof that customers have, uh, have uh, or rather are enjoying the food as uh, the technology as well. 
And finally, uh, fitness trackers continue to be hot must-have gadgets. However, waterproof fitness trackers for swimmers are often limited to data gathering, such as stroke rate per minute or distance swim. Hong Kong-based startup uh, Platzins is hoping to make a bigger splash with its ring-style swim analyzer instead of a typical wrist, uh, wrist one device. The sealed prototype comprises two rings, one on the middle finger of each hand. Force and motion sensors collect data on the hand's movement as they push through the water, as well as the force exerted uh, into the water. And that is what is trending today. Now there is a happy ending for two motherless tiger cubs now at a California zoo. VOA's Faith Lapidus has the story. The birth of a critically endangered Sumatran tiger cub in July at the Smithsonian's National Zoo in Washington was celebrated. But less than three weeks later, his mother, Demai, began displaying aggressive behaviors toward him whenever he tried to nurse. Zookeepers began feeding the cub a special formula to supplement his diet and kept reintroducing him to his mother. But when it became obvious that Demai would not accept him, the zoo's animal care staff decided to transfer him to the San Diego Zoo Safari Park, which had a motherless Bengal tiger cub about the same age. Monday morning, keepers prepared the cub for his cross-country journey. Food, towels, flash drives. Got your stuff? Mm -hmm. Got my stuff? Just need a tiger. Okay, let's go get him. Let's go get him. Settled in a roomy kennel, the cub and his keepers took a non-stop flight to San Diego, where he could grow up with a surrogate brother. The California cub had been confiscated from a smuggler and brought to the zoo, where it was also being bottle fed. The introduction went very well. In fact, we uh, initially had them uh, where they just had visual access and they could kind of see each other and smell each other and vocalize at each other between the bars and not necessarily where they can, they can get together. And after about a half an hour of that, we went ahead and put them together and instantly they bonded. You can see them playing, getting along well. It's the best thing for both of them to be together. Guests at the safari park can watch the cubs interact through the glass walls of the animal care center's nursery. Zoo officials hope they'll grow up as siblings and learn to be tigers together. I'm Faith Lapidus, VOA News. Well, and that's our show for today, and I'll be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening Radio Show Africa News tonight at 1800 UTC and in the mornings. Today, break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC. That's Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us in Washington, have a good night. Welcome to English in a Minute. A cannon used to be a common military weapon. Loose cannon. So are Anna and Jonathan talking about an old battle? Hey, I'm looking for someone to host a political event tomorrow night. Can your friend Sylvia help out? Sylvia, she's a loose cannon. You never know what she's going to say. She could easily